each of the gentlemen, and you've got the program there. We do have one substitution. Uh, Crick Waters is now in for Jaja rather than Trevor because Trevor had a conflict and couldn't be here. Really wanted to, but sometimes you can't be where you'd like to be. We'll start out with uh, Bill, and then we'll follow with uh, Limo Foundation or, or Limo Foundation, if that's the way you like to pronounce it, and that's Andrew. And then uh, Crick will go third. And then, of course, as is usual, I'll ask you if you've got questions, and if you really force me to, I'll ask my own. So Bill, go ahead. Um, well, I, I'm going to dispose of my uh, lengthy 20-page uh, presentation here in PowerPoint fashion, um, and just maybe give a little bit of an overview um, on, on some of my perspectives on open access. So when I'm speaking here, I'm speaking uh, for myself, not for my clients, uh, not for anybody I represent. Um, so uh, the, the open access debate, it's very interesting. It's, it's really reared its head in the last several years. And the question, I think, on many people's minds is, you know, why is that the case? There's really two, um, I think, driving factors. Uh, the first is the, the uh, development of, of broadband um, and the impact that that's had on, on applications. So, uh, it wasn't too long ago, um, and my parents just moved to broadband, but a lot of people were using dial-up. And obviously dial-up had its limitations in that, in that you needed to actually dial up in order to get access. So with broadband, it's an always-on connection, and it's, and it's got the capabilities to be able to handle uh, throughput. So we can put video on, on broadband. We can put uh, voice over IP on broadband. Um, so you know, a lot of innovative companies have used that to be able to deliver content services. They're able to deliver voice services, they're able to deliver video services. Um, which arguably puts them, uh, these applications, in an, in an environment where they're competing directly with the underlying carriers. Uh, so carrier X that delivers broadband to your home um, uh, is now competing with an application provider uh, that provides a competitive voice service. So when Ed Whitaker said, you know, get off of my pipes, he was talking about the fact that really broadband um, had enabled a tro really a Trojan horse. It was a Trojan horse from, the, I think, these carriers' perspective in that broadband enabled people to be, build applications that provided functionality that competed with the underlying core services that, that, that uh, the, the carriers were providing. And the same is true, I think, of video. So, um, you know, we're may be familiar, maybe you're not, but there have been a number of cable companies that have announced that, you know, they're interested in perhaps imposing bandwidth caps. Um, they would, I think, argue that uh, this, these services are putting constraints. Um, it's, there's additional cost which they need to recover. Um, you know, the, perhaps the, 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 um, the other perspective is that, you know, they're concerned about the fact that people are going to use Hulu use uh, Juice, use other video services, and um, not take their uh, take their their product. I mean, argue uh, excellent point. AT and T obviously is pouring you know hundreds of millions and billions of dollars into into its uh, Uber's service. Uh, Verizon is pouring you know billions of dollars into FiOS. So you know these are publicly traded companies, and um, presumably someone in management is saying, why is anybody going to subscribe to this stuff if they can get it for free over the internet um, via via Site like Hulu, um, so that's that's one aspect of, of um, the debate. The other aspect is that um, we're seeing a deregulation in Washington, and uh, not to be too Washington D.C. lawyer, but the the Telecommunications Act, the act that governs uh, communications regulation, was uh, was back. It was developed. And created back in the 30s, was amended in, in several times, but it was uh, it's it's there's different titles. So Title II is wireline, common carrier. Title III is wireless. Title VI is cable. So everything was siloed, and it made a lot of sense. Um, now things aren't so siloed. So what is the cable service? That's a question a lot of people were asking when when these new services came out. People had different answers. What is a wireless service? What is a common carrier wireline service? Um, VoIP, arguably, the FCC hasn't decided this, but VoIP isn't arguably covered by Title II. Um, so 
understand a little bit about common carrier regulation. What does it mean to be a common carrier? That is, Verizon is a common carrier. It's also certain aspects of its business are not common carrier. So the internet aspects are not common carrier. Um, the, the providing a pipe, arguably, depending on the type, type of pipe, is a common carrier um, enterprise when they offer it to, to everyone and they don't do it on a private basis. Um, there's a, two key provisions in, in, in Title II that um, are, the, are the reasons why we really haven't had this debate up until now. Um, and it's two, so section 201 and Section 2. And, and what, what those sections of the Communications Act require of common carriers is that they not unreasonably discriminate in their services. Um, so, you know, what does that mean? Well, the FCC, I can't really tell you because the FCC decided on a case-by-case -case basis what Title Section 201 and Section 20 meant, 202 meant. But, you know, back in the 30s, there was a case called Carter Phone and Hush a Phone, and it, literally there was a device that, um, that you would put on your phone and it would keep your conversations private when you were in your cube or whatever they had back then. Uh, and AT&T argued that this device and selling it um, violated their tariff uh, because it could damage the network. And the AT FCC said, no, this is a violation of 201 and 202. You're unreasonably uh, discriminating against this company, um, and so you can't, you can't do that. So what has happened over the, over the last several years is that a lot of these services, which we thought were in Title II, are moving into Title I, which is but there's a big question mark over Title I. What can the FCC do with Title I? But those section, section 201 and 202 disappear when you move things into this other bucket. And so the question everyone is asking and the, and the net neutrality debate centers around is when you take things out of Title II, what does it mean to un, unreasonably discriminate? And so that's why we're talking today about things like network management uh, we're talking about blocking. I was involved in the Madison River case for Vonage. Um, that was a great case to work on because, you know, it was <laughs> regulated service and they were blocking. So it was, it was, a, it was a perfect case. It's not so easy anymore. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the question, and I think, uh, Gary, you, you said, you know, you're not necessarily a network neutrality proponent. And, and I think and I, I can understand, but I think there's, there's a lot of um, miscommunication about what, what network neutrality is. And I think what the debate is about is when you move things into Title I, what does unreasonably discriminate mean? It doesn't mean you can't, under certain conditions, alter the framework in which you're providing your service. So ne network management, I think many, mo most of the proponents of, of, the, of network neutrality would say, under, under certain conditions, that makes sense. But if, if network management means if you're providing a service that competes with mine, you know, I'm going to degrade it, then that's, that's you know, arguably something companies are going to have a problem with. So I just want to provide that framework. I've got a lot of specifics I could get into, but, but uh, I hope that frames the debate. Should generate some questions. It has to. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, well, so, so th thanks for being here today. Um, uh, Andrew Shikiar with, with Limo Foundation, uh, and I'll give you some more background on, on who we are and, and, and what we do uh, momentarily. Uh, but you know, when I look at open access and open networks, um, you know, I, I really think that, that both are a byproduct of requirements for, for the next generation of, of consumer experiences and consumer services, uh, that as we uh, go through kind of a, a transformative uh, period of change. Um, you're seeing a confluence of, of, of trends in, uh, towards openness, uh, both from a cultural standpoint, uh, from a business standpoint, and also from a technology standpoint. And uh, this openness uh, begets uh, collaboration, uh, both in, in technology and in applications, and uh, also uh, where Limo is concerned in, in, in foundational uh, cooperation and, and development. So when Limo looks at open access and networks, we know we're looking at it from a mobile perspective. Um, and we're looking at it for the demands uh, and requirements for, from the ecosystem um, that, that would be fed into a mobile platform. Uh, so Limo Foundation, uh, for those of you who are not, but let me ask, how many of you have heard of, of Limo Foundation? Organization? Okay, great. So Limo Foundation is a consortium of around 50 companies that are working together uh, to create a common mobile operating system.